on to the very last of the Moedei of the night, the appointed times of the Lord. Yeshua, that's what you gave us. Since you gave the Torah over at Mount Sinai, it's you who gave us these words that we have in Leviticus 23 and these feasts that we observe even to this very day. So Lord, I just pray that as we come upon this wonderful feast of Sukkot, closing out the fall feast of Israel, actually not the fall feast of Israel, your holy feast. Lord, as we come across this, Lord, may we honor it in the sense of recognizing that it is your son, that when he came down to this earth, in a human form, he fulfilled this. And Lord, we see in a future that when he comes and reigns and rules on this earth, he will completely fulfill this feast. So as with all the other Noah day, Lord, you partially fulfilled them all when you came the first time, and you will totally fulfill them at your second coming. We thank you for that. We thank you for biblical prophecy that teaches us your truth and points to your son, Yeshua. Thank you, Lord. In his name we pray. So today we're going to be talking about Sukkot, which is tabernacles, or Feast of Booths. And if you were going to Israel now, you would see uh, in Jerusalem in particular, where there are balconies that go up high rises, you're going to see little booths, sukkahs, built off from those balconies. Those on the ground floor has it even a little bit easier, and they can build larger Sukkot. And so today we have some of our folks in Eretz Israel right now. John and Lisa are out there right now. And if I could, if, and by the way, this is about the most uh, expensive time of all the year to go. Because any time you go during one of the biblical feasts, then this is going to be very, very expensive on you. If you go with me to Leviticus chapter 23, we read about the Feast of Sukkot. On the Feast of Sukkot, the Lord says to Moshe, verse 33, Tell the people of Israel on the fifteenth day of the seventh month is a Feast of Sukkot, or Tabernacles, for seven days to Adonai. On the first day there is to be a holy convocation. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. For seven days you are to bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. On the eighth day you are to have a holy convocation and bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. It is a day of public assembly. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. These are the designated times of Adonai. You are to proclaim his holy convocations and bring an offering made by fire to Adonai, a burnt offering, a grain offering, a sacrifice, and drink offerings, each on its own day, besides the Shabbats of Adonai, your gifts, all your vows, and all your voluntary offerings that you give to Adonai. Now, Sukkot is one of the three pilgrimage feasts in a year. The very first pilgrimage feast is that of Pesach, Passover. The second one is Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, 50 days later, roughly. And this is the last one of them. This is Sukkot, or Tabernacles. So this feast is the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of Booths, also known as the Feast of Ingathering, because this would be a pilgrimage feast, gathering in. Of the three pilgrimage feasts, we see in Exodus chapter 23, 14 through 17. If you have your Bibles, it's a good idea to go there. Jewish men would go to Israel, to Jerusalem, where the temple was, to make this particular feast, when the temple was standing. And we got a little hint here in this passage that we just read in Leviticus 23, what they were to bring with them or to purchase when they got to Jerusalem as far as the sacrifice goes. Now today, there is no temple, there is no working priesthood, there are Levites, and therefore there is no sacrificial system. If you do not have a temple, you do not have the working priest or the Levites, working meaning that you do have a temple and it's all set up, then there is no sacrifice. And along with that, without having the temple there, without having the sacrificial system there, then there is not a need to go every year out a pilgrimage feast. So what we see here is that God tells us this is one of the three pilgrimage feasts. 
Pesach, that's Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Now, in history, it's recorded that Pontius Pilate, when he was ruling over Judea, Pontius Pilate would always increase the number of his soldiers in the city of Jerusalem on these days. The reason for that is because there were so many more Jewish people coming. Some of them were zealous, and some of them wanted to do away with Rome. So that's why Pontius Pilate made the trip all the way to Jerusalem. Now, his preference would be for all the rest of the year would to stay down in Caesarea. This is where Herod had built a temple, uh, no, temple, a villa, if you will, a palace, if you will, in honor of of, uh, uh, Caesar. My brain is getting ahead of my mouth. (laughs) So Caesarea would be where he would rather be, in a very palatial palace by the Mediterranean. And if you've been to Israel, you know what I'm talking about as far as the ruins go. That would be an awesome place to have a palace. But for these three pilgrimage feasts, as God commanded in Exodus 23, 14 through 17, Pontius Pilate would, of course, triple the guard, if not more than that. Now, this is a feast that our Lord Yeshua celebrated as well. You'll see that when Yeshua traveled around the Galileo, that was his main place to travel. Generally speaking, he would avoid Yehuda or Judah because the Judeans were out to kill him. But when the festival of Sukkot in Judah was near, then he was being asked by his brothers if he was going to go up there. John chapter 7. But the festival of Sukkot in Judah was near. His brothers said, leave here and go into Judah so that your disciples can see the miracles you do. Now, believe it or not, they did not believe in him yet. And indeed, Mary had other children besides Yeshua. I think I'm conflicting with Catholic doctrine. Yeah, well, the Pope said that uh, the life of the shoe was a prayer. So here we see that his brothers, and he had other brothers, and he had sisters. They spoke that way to him because they hadn't yet come to faith in him at all, in the brother. And, you know, it goes along with the line that a prophet is not without honor. In other words, he has honor everywhere but what? His own hometown. Familiarity, as the modern adage goes, breeds contempt. So the more you familiar you are with somebody, the less high you esteem them to be, evidently. And his brothers were very familiar with him. Yeshua said to them, my time has not yet come, but for you, any time is okay or right. The world can't hate you, but it does hate me because I keep telling it how wicked its ways are. I just saw something on Facebook, and it showed two different pastors. And the one pastor is teaching or the people whatever they wanted to hear, and it's crowded. The other pastor is teaching what people didn't necessarily want to hear about their sin, about their need to repent, and very few were there. The, the truth is, people don't want to hear that they're sinners. They like to think that they're okay. Yeah, their ears are stopped. And this is where the Lord Yeshua says, You've got to have spiritual ears and spiritual eyes to be able to see and to hear. So what we're looking at here is here the brothers did not have the spiritual ears or spiritual eyes to see where their old brother Yeshua was coming from. So he keeps telling the world how wicked its ways are. But he didn't come for judgment at that time. He came as a lamb to take care of all of our sins. You've got to confront an alcoholic that an alcoholic is an alcoholic before he will get any help. So that is the first step for the remedy to help that alcoholic come to grips with his alcoholism. Well, we have a problem ourselves, and the scripture says that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Well, you know when you start pointing your finger at somebody, Look at your sin. Oh, let me let me take care of that little moat in your eyes, sis. You've got three fingers. That means it's multiplying. You've got three fingers pointing back at yourself. 
The only way you can avoid it is like what Glenn is doing. <laughs> but I'll be honest with you, no matter how you point the finger, it's still not going to get away from the fact that you have sin. And as I've said before, the difference between a moat and a log is not in the content or the material itself. It's wood. It's wood. It has to do with the quantity. And when we start pointing out sins of other people, maybe the quantity points back at us because we tend to recognize the sins in others that we ourselves have. Same material, difference in quantity. Yeshua is offering himself as a redemption for our sins. And so when he points it out, it's not like he's giving you a problem without a solution. As we're seeing within these feasts, he knew what the solution was, and he willingly offered himself as that solution for our sins. Did you notice the placement? Yes, we've gone through Torah studies before. Did you notice the placement during the days of the tabernacle, during the days of the temple? Did you notice the placement of where the sacrificial system takes place? The first thing that happens as soon as you approach the gate in the Mishkan, what is standing right there needing to be done? The sacrifice. The priest are standing there, the Levite is there with the Mizrach. Mizrach is that pointed end container that cannot be set down to keep the blood from coagulating. There's the priest. You come bring your offering to the, the priest right at the gate. You sacrifice the thing yourself. And the priest is there to enable and help you. And the Mizrach, the collector, is going to take that blood. The Levite is going to hold on to that thing, and it's going to be offered. The very first thing that needs to be dealt with is the sin issue. And we talked about that on Yom Kippur. There's only one thing that atones for sin. It's not tzedakah, charity. It's not tefillah, prayer. And it's not Teshuvah alone. I mean, I can repent, repent, repent. But it's one thing. That is the blood. The life is in the blood. The only way that you're going to have atonement, as we talked about on Yom Kippur, is through the shedding of blood. The very first thing that you're going to do when you come and present your offering to the Lord is you're going to be a part of the sacrifice of that particular offering. It dies. And you're going to see how ugly the penalty of sin is. It dies so that you can have atonement. So that's what Yeshua did. He is not just providing a problem and saying, you're wicked, you're wicked, you're wicked. But he's providing the solution with the problem. One of the things I used to demand of those when I was in the military and when I was a staff, staff sergeant, People would come to me with problems, problems. I'd say, okay, you already have a solution for that. Or are you just going to tell me what the problem is? Because we need a solution to problems. Don't just complain to me about all the problems. The problems, hey, what's a solution? Now, maybe that solution will work. Maybe that solution won't. Hopefully, my experience in the military would have helped to direct that. And I believe you, me, there are some folks in the lower ranks that actually have good solutions to the problem. But I'll be honest with you, just presenting problems is not the way to go about things. This is a problem, wickedness, sin. But Yeshua himself provides the solution to the problem. He came built in with that. He says to his brothers, you go up on to the festival. As for me, I'm not going to go up to this festival now because the right time for me has not yet come. Now, there is an illusion there, you know, where Yeshua has several times in the scripture said, my time has not yet come. And it's pointing to the time when his blood would actually be shed. But this, at this point in time, this was something he was going to do alone. He wasn't going to go up with his brothers. He stays on in the Galil for a little bit, but after his brothers go up to the festival, then he goes up. Not publicly. So he's going around in secret at the festival of Sukkot. And the Judeans were looking for him, saying, where is he? 
And among the crowds, there was much whispering about Yeshua. Some said, he's a good man. Others said, no, he's deceiving the masses. Even today, that's what they will say. However, no one spoke about him openly for fear of the Judeans. And it wasn't until the festival was half over. Now, how many days does this feast go? Eight. So in the fourth day, it says, Yeshua went up to the temple courts and began to teach. Now, we know the concept of Sukkot, building the tabernacle. The tabernacle or the tent. Now, the tabernacle was also was actually called the Mishkan. And the concept of Mishkan was where God could fellowship with sinful man. You've got holy God and you've got sinful man, and there the twain shall interact unless there's something taking place that needs to be done before that can happen. That's why the sacrificial system was there. That's why the tent of meeting was there. Everything had to be done so that man could enter into the presence of a holy God. More about that tomorrow night. But here we have it, halfway through the festival of Sukkot, tabernacles, where Yeshua goes into the temple courts and begins to teach. Now that's a good place for him to be, because the one thing that followed after the Mishkan was the building of what? The temple by Solomon. When we go to 1 Kings 8, we're going to find exactly which season Solomon went ahead and dedicated this temple. And the date of dedication is not by accident, because there's a remez, there's a strong hint between when the temple was dedicated and what the temple was. So here we go to 1 Kings 8. In verse number 1, it says, Shlomo assembled all the leaders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and the chiefs, of the paternal clans of all the people of Israel to King Shlomo and Jerusalem to bring the Ark for the Covenant of Adonai out of the city of David, also known as Sion. All the men of Israel assembled before King Shlomo at the festival in the month of Etanim. Which month is it? Seventh month. Which month are we in now? Seventh month. And then it says they brought the Ark for the Covenant, verse 6. That's the priest did that. At that point in time, there was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put in there at Horeb. Now we know from our study of the Torah that there were a couple other things. One of the things that were in there was the banner. Another thing that was there was the rod of Aaron. And we see that all we've got is the tablets of stone. And then it says in verse 10, when the Kohanim came out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of Adonai, so that because of the cloud, the Kohanim could not stand up to perform their service for the kabod, the glory of Adonai filled the house of Adonai. Now, when is it that Solomon did this? Well, it was in the seventh month, but it also says, if you look at verse 65, it says, so Shlomo celebrated the festival at that time. Now it's assumed you know what festival it is in the seventh month. Well, let's see. We're in the seventh month. On the first of the month, we celebrated what? Yom Teruah, a.k.a. Rosh Hashanah. Now, just last week, we celebrated another festival, or holy day, Yom HaKippurim, the Day of the Atonement. And now, tomorrow night, at sundown, we're celebrating the last of the festivals. Which one of these festivals are we talking about now? Not Yom Teruah, that's one day only. Not Yom HaKippurim, that's one day only. But look at what Solomon did. Now, Solomon did things in a big way. He doubled up on things. If you look inside of his uh, temple and his building, you see there's more than one menorah. Well, he more than doubled up on it. And he more than doubled up on the table of showbread. He did things in a grandiose way. That's that temple. But look at what we see here. The festival, page uh, 379 of your complete Jewish Bible, if you don't have it. We're on page six, uh, verse 65. All Israel, a huge <laughs> gathering that had come all the way from the entrance of Hamat, that's buried down in the south, to the body of Egypt, that's buried to the west and south, 
celebrated with him before our Adonai, our God, for seven days. Now, what is this feast of Sukkot? It has how many days? Eight days. And then it says for seven more days. See, he doubled up, he doubled up. Fourteen and all. Now, when something is doubled in Scripture, what does that mean? Take notice. You better take notice of the thing. So we know seven days, but he doubled up on it. That makes another seven days. I mean, double the joy. But it says, verse 66, on the eighth day. Now, what feast has eight days? This one. Sukkot has it. This temple of Solomon was dedicated on Sukkot. There is no other festival in the seventh month. So the temple was dedicated. The Beit HaMikdash was dedicated on Sukkot. Now, does that help you to understand why was it that Yeshua was there in the temple courts teaching on Sukkot? Because his great, 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 great whatever, grandfather built that temple. And he began to teach. As I said, if there's no temple, no working priesthood, there's no longer an obligation upon Jewish people to do a pilgrimage. I'll tell you honestly, I would love to be Lisa and John right now. They are there during this feast. I would love to do that. The only time I can afford to do it is earlier in the year or later in the year, not on feast days. Because the hotel prices go up very high and there would be no room at the inn. <laughs> Listen to me. Tomorrow night I'm going to be talking about Yeshua's birthday. Yes. There's no room at the inn. Yes. This is his birthday. And the nations will be one day celebrating his birthday on the correct day, not on Saturnalia. So here we are now during the time there is no temple. So in modern day Israel, many Jews living in or near Jerusalem make an effort to attend prayer services at the Western Wall. So if you were able to watch tomorrow, if you were able to watch the Western Wall, there's a camera there. You can watch it 24 seven. You'll see a whole bunch of people dominating at that wall. And they sort of emulate the pilgrimages in some fashion. As I just talked about in Leviticus 23, all the way in verses 33 to 44, this is just one of the modi. It's eight days total. Again, you got the fe Feast of Booths for seven days plus one. Now, let's look at numerology. Seven is the number of what? Perfection. Completeness. Eight is the number of what? New beginnings. Renewal. New beginnings. A baby... Hebrew boy is circumcised on what day of his life? The eighth day of his life. What day is he actually giving a name? He's not given a name prior to that. What day? Eighth. On the eighth day. After he is circumcised, he is given a name. We see this pattern biblically, which I didn't have ready here, but I will in a second here. Follow with me. I think it's in Luke. When, there we go, Luke chapter 2. It says in verse 21, on the eighth day when it was time for his brief milah, that's his circumcision, he was given the name Yeshua, which is what the angel had called him before his conception. Eighth day, new beginnings, this is where he actually starts his life as an individual within the community of Israel. He's not even given a name. So what we see here is a typology we're going to be looking at tomorrow night. We're seeing a typology of this where Yeshua would be born on the first day of Sukkot and he would be circumcised on the eighth day of Sukkot and be given his name on the eighth day. So you got your typology there. Now, just to let you know, the first day, this year, it's on Sunday night through Monday night sundown. 
Now, if you happen to have a calendar, you're going to see there's two days. Yeah, he's got a picture there. There's not a lot of people there yet. That's live. That's live, I know. I know it's live. Anyway, if, if you want to see Israel right now at the White Whaling Wall, they're not there yet. That's tomorrow night. The first and the eighth days are Sabbaths, where there's no work, laborious work of any kind. We cook, though. What? We can cook, though. Yeah, we can. Yes. That's not laborious work unless yes. cooking is a labor to you. <laughs> Maybe if you're a chef, you might not. But just to let you know, again, tomorrow night, sundown, Monday night, sundown. If you look at the Hebrew calendar, which I don't have in front of me right now, you will see two days that are blued out in their Sabbaths. But two days has to do with the fact that if you're farther away from the land, then it gives you an accommodation in case you miss the timing. Oh, she's good. Find oh, I'll find September really quick. Thank you, my love. You know why I have a help me like this? How can she ever put up with me for almost 33 years? It beats me. Wait a minute. Okay. There you go. Starting tomorrow night at 13, you see the little shade right there. All the way through Monday, all the way through Tuesday, you see it blue right here, right? That means they're coming in as two different days of Sabbath. So you can pass that around if people wanted to see it. I only go by what the scripture says. The first day and the last day are Shabbats, the first and eighth days. There are also holy convocations. So on the first day, tomorrow night, we're going to be at Larry Morell's. If Chris Crocker is right, we're going to be at Larry Morell's celebrating over there. Bring plenty of food. Give it be kosher food. Bring plenty. Anyway, on the eighth day, where are we going to be? We're going to be at Larry Morell's. Bring plenty of food. <laughs> Lots of food. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what do we do during this time of the year? Well, it's a time to rejoice. Joy. We're going to be looking tomorrow night, I've got handouts for this, how when John the baptizer was born, we can see it's a time of rejoicing. But John the baptizer was six months older than Yeshua, so he wasn't born on Sukkot. <laughs> if Yeshua was born on Sukkot, which I believe, and I'll be teaching that tomorrow night, then six months before Sukkot is when John the baptizer would have been, been born, which would have put us in the Passover season. So anyway, this is a time of rejoicing. And we rejoice for, before our God for some days. Now, look at Solomon. When we looked at that passage in 1 Kings 8, what were the people doing for all those days? They were what? Rejoicing. Now, Yom Kippur is very somber and solemn. It's not even a feast. It's a moment. Yom Teruah is the beginning of the Yomim, Noraim, the days of awe, where we should be in the place of repentance, reconciliation. So it isn't really somber, but it's sort of somber. But this one, we finish all the feasts in the calendar year, and we're not counting Hanukkah, because that's not a biblical feast, even though Yeshua observed it. More about that when we get closer to it. But we're in a time of rejoicing right now. What do we do? According to Scripture, Leviticus 23, verse 40, it says, On the first day you will take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches, and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook. Now, we've got the Arba, Arba Menim in my house right now. You've got the Ekrat, then you've got the palm, then you've got the willow, and then you've got the myrtle the Hadassim. And you've got the four species that are bound together, except for Etrog, which is going to be held separately in the other hand. So you'll be taking the Lulav in one hand, you've got the Etrog in another, with the stem facing downward, all these traditional things, and then you're waving them before the Lord. You wave them in six directions, east, south, west, north, up, and down, symbolizing the fact that God is everywhere. So that's what we're going to be doing to, tomorrow night and rejoicing before the Lord. Now, the people of Israel were commanded to live in booths for seven days. Is that supposed to happen all the time, every Sukkot? 
that happens? Or is it only just that one time or those times back in the days of the temple? Every time. It's supposed to happen every time, all the time. And the purpose of that was for us to recall in the seventh month as a perpetual statute, perpetual means all the time, thank you, that we're to recall that our generations ahead of us lived in booths when we came out from the land of Egypt. We, that's our memory, that's our mnemonic aid. We're doing this to remind ourselves that our ancestors lived in booths. And why? Did they? In the wilderness. Pardon? And the reason why they lived in booths. And the reason why. So here God is trying to remind us of something of our predecessors. Did our people do that, even though it was perpetual? Throughout your generations, did they do that faithfully? When they got into the land, the answer is no. They actually didn't do it faithfully until they returned back from captivity during the time of Nehemiah. If you go to Nehemiah chapter 8, then it was, they saw that it was written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moshe that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the, fest, the feast of the seventh month. He commanded that they go to the hills, bring olive branches, wild olive branches, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the booth for the sukkah that Larry has this year was kind of like the one last year, right? You didn't put together one of those wood frame sukkot. Now, you know what we're, you know what the rabbi says, you're going to have to have holes in the top of it so that we can be able to see the stars and the promise that was made to Abraham? It has a hole. It does have a hole. Or a chimney. So I if you wish it. to look at the stars, look through the chimney hole. <laughs> Do not make other holes in his roof because it's really a tent. It's a canvas tent. If you cannot build a sofa, I can't build a sofa anymore. Since my shoulder surgery, since my knee surgery, I can't get up on ladders. I'm not supposed to get up on ladders. But David, you know me. Do I get up on ladders? Probably so, yes. <laughs> but if I want to honor, now I really want to build a sofa. I can't do that anymore. And we're all commanded to have a sofa. So if somebody wants to come over and build a sukkah for me, I'd be most grateful. We just have to find a lot of wood around the property. But anyway. How many legs does a sukkah have to have? Um, generally, it's four, but not yes. have to. The word okay. is half. So you could have three. You can. If Try you, it. If you, yeah, if you can get it up. I know. You know, the thing yes, is, the rabbis have certain specifications for building the sukkah. One of the big ones is it must not be attached to any permanent structure. The whole concept of sukkot was to remind us how our ancestors lived. And if their sukkah was attached to like a tree and they couldn't move it when the cloud moved, the people had to move. So you've got to remember this stuff. When the cloud moved, the people had to move. Well, they couldn't say to Moses, well, I've got it attached and nailed to this tree. You know what would happen to them? Well, the people would go where the cloud was, and they would remain all by themselves wherever that tree was. Another thing is, this is not a permanent dwelling. It's meant to be temporary. It's to remind us how temporary our life is. Somebody asked uh, a question after John D. Rockefeller died. How much did he leave behind? The answer was, all of it. It didn't matter how much it was, it was all of it. How many of your accumulations are you going to bring with you when you pass on? And by the way, this thing here that I'm wearing, I can't even take that. And it is called by the same Greek name as the rabbis used for Sukkot or Sukkah. It's called a tent. Paul says it. Peter says it. You know what you're wearing right now? You are wearing a Sukkah. All I'm seeing is your Sukkot in this congregation. I'm seeing your tent. I'm seeing your tent. I'm seeing your tent. But you know what? You even leave your tent behind. So anything in that tent, all the things you own, even the tent itself, you leave behind. That's the lesson we need to learn. The lesson of Sukkot is this is temporary. 
So building a sukha is the physical manifestation of the spiritual god of us living inside us. Precisely. Perfect. So my pergola that's three legs and cemented in the ground can't be used? It's what? It's cemented into the ground. Well, we've got to build something else, lady. <laughs> Anything that's built permanently into the ground, x <laughs> uh, you know, it won't happen. You know what we're saying here? Life is temporary. All the things that we have, this is all temporary. So we have to live our lives as Abraham did. You know what the concept of a good eye is? That you're generous like Abraham was? Abraham was very wealthy, the scripture says. But he had his eyes focused on something other than the things here. In the Ulam Haze, you know, the, what we have today, the world today, he had his eyes fixed on another place. And that's what the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us. His good eye was he could see clearly that this was not his home that he was a foreigner traveling through this land. And that's the idea, the object lesson behind Sukkot. All this is temporary. We're just foreigners traveling through. And anything that we have and everything that we accumulate, including however much weight I accumulate, <laughs> that's all gone. Baruch Hashem. Yes. <laughs> we have to do what God did through Israel, through Nehemiah. We have to go back and do what God's word says because there's so much richness in it for us. Now, Yeshua fulfills this feast, more about that tomorrow night. In Luke chapter 24, I don't know why I didn't write down the scripture, but this one I know off the top of my head. Luke 24, beginning in 44, Yeshua says to them, this is what I meant when I was still with you and told you that everything written about me in the Torah, that's the five books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, the Nevi'im, that's the prophets, starting with the book of Joshua, and going all the way up until you get to Psalms, and that's why they say the Psalms, that's known as the Ketuvim, the Ketuvim, or the writings, begins with Psalms in the Hebrew Bible. So now you've got your three divisions of Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Yeshua in the upper room, says to his disciples after he had died and resurrected, he says, everything written about me in the Torah of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms had to be fulfilled. Then he opened their mind so that they could understand the Tanakh, telling them, here's what it says. The Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. Now we saw that typology on Yom Teruah with the Akita, the binding of Isaac, Genesis chapter 22. We saw that typology. But we also saw the three days sitting right in there in that typology in Genesis 22. But then Yeshua himself says that the sign that will be given to this rebellious and stubborn people will be the sign of that of Yonah, where Yonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. And we showed you from the Hebrew, just tucked upon it, I love going back to my Hebrew again, I've got a Sabra in Israel that I'm taking classes from, along with about a half a dozen other folks. And we went into the prophet Yonah, and we saw that he actually died and resurrected in the belly of the whale. Oh. So you've got the three days and the three nights with both the Akita, the binding of Isaac, as well as the, uh, the prophet Jonah in three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. So that is the Messiah to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. That's uh, Yom Teruah. I showed how that fit Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets. In his name, repentance leading to forgiveness of sin is to be proclaimed to the people. We showed how that was with the combination of Yom Teruah, where we have our days of awe, our days of Teshuvah, our days of repenting, and then in the day of Yom Kippur. So we saw that. And Yom Kippur is the one sacrifice for everybody in Israel all at once, once a year. So we see how just right here talks about two of the uh, scriptures that go ahead in the New Testament that share with us how Yeshua fulfilled these two feasts in his first coming. We talked about this on Yom Kippur, but I want to point us to this next feast, Sukkot. 
The writer of the book of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 1 says, For the law, or the Torah, since it only has a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of these things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make perfect those who draw near. Including that of the high priest going into the Holy of Holies once a year. All these sacrifices could never bring to completeness. These people would have to keep on offering them over and over and over and over and over again. Here, we see why. Because it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Now, only John, the cousin of our Lord Yeshua, said it, and said it clearly. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So, these sacrifices were kafar. Cover, 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 cover. Just like pitch covers. That first word, use of kafar, happens when Noah was commanded to put pitch on the outside of the ark and on the inside. That is the word pitch, kafar. So all these sacrifices over and over and over and over again just covered, but could not take away. Now we get into the next feast. Therefore, when he, that is Yeshua, comes into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Now that's Sukkot. If Yeshua were, as the Gnostic teachings say, just an ethereal being and not in the flesh, and you know that John fights against it, several places it says those who say that Yeshua has not come in the flesh is of the anti-Christ or anti-Messiah. Why did John come against it? Because Yeshua indeed came in the flesh. It is absolutely essential for him to have come in the flesh to become like us and made in the likeness of men so that he could be the perfect sacrifice. If he didn't come into the flesh, then he wouldn't be like us. And the writer of the book of Hebrews says he was tested in all ways as we are yet without sin. He had to come in the flesh. He had to be tested. He had to overcome. He had to be sinless in order to become the perfect sacrifice. So now you see how we jumped from the death and resurrection of Yeshua and the Akita, the binding of Isaac, and in the typology of Jonah, to the one sacrifice, the perfect high priest, the perfect sacrifice, offering his perfect blood in the perfect tabernacle made without hands, right of the book of Hebrews. This is all because he came in the flesh. If he didn't come in the flesh, he couldn't have done this. And that gets me to this feast of Sukkot. As the writer of the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, verse 10, it's in connection with this, these sacrifices, with this will that we have been separated for God and made holy once and for all through the offering of Yeshua the Messiah's what? Body. That's his sukkah. You're wearing a sukkah? You're wearing a sukkah. You're wearing a sukkah. I'm wearing a sukkah. We're all wearing sukkot. Peter and Paul both tell us that. And here is where the word is made flesh. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. Apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And the word became flesh and dwelt. Now that's, even Dr. Stern translates it as dwelt. That's not the most accurate word that anybody could have used. Because the word that is used for dwelt here is another word. I'm going to jump ahead here briefly. I hope that I don't... Uh, drive somebody crazy uh, who's watching this on the internet. What if you go to Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, Strong's number 4637, the definition of this Greek word is to fix one's tabernacle, to have one's tabernacle abide or live in a tabernacle or tent, or just the word tabernacle. See, dwell is a second choice. Why is it that everybody chooses the second choice instead of the first choice? I don't even know why Dr. Stern did that, but that's what he did. This is the Greek word. If you go instead to the Hebrew of Leviticus 23:34, you've got sukkah. 
I read Greek, uh, Hebrew better than Greek anymore. <laughs> and the sukkah is your booth. If you go to the Septuagint, the 72 rabbis that translated Leviticus 23:34, you're going to see skeno. Oh, and that is exactly the same word that you're seeing here for tabernacle. So whose fault is this? The 72 rabbis. They translated it to the word tabernacle. And that came from Leviticus chapter 23, verse 34. So John uses the same Greek word, the Koine Greek word in John 1.14, that those 72 rabbis of the Septuagint used to translate Leviticus 23.34 for booth, tabernacle, or sukkah. Isn't that interesting? These 72 rabbis came up with this all on their own. And Paul uses that same word for what we're wearing. Peter uses that same word for what we're wearing. You're wearing a sukkah, I'm wearing a sukkah. All of us are wearing sukkahs. Good, we got that established. Any questions? Now, this concept here of life and light, that's a very Hebraic first century concept. They're equated one with another. Light and life are one and the same. No time to really get into that this time, but there's a relationship in it, and there's a relationship in it with the festival of Sukkot. During the time of the temple, huge lamps were erected in the woman's courtyard to illuminate the festival of water libation. Each of these consisted of four containers of oil mounted on a huge pole. Young priests in training were given the task of filling those lamps by climbing up on them. They're huge, on ladders while carrying great jugs of oil. And then they pour them into the containers at the top. Then the wicks of these lamps from Mishnah Sukkot 5.3, you can actually read it yourself if you go there. The wicks were made from the worn out garments of the priest. And in the Mishnah it says, there was not a courtyard in all of Jerusalem that, that, that did not reflect the light. Now Jerusalem is sitting on top of a mountain. If you're coming from, and we have done that numerous times, if you're coming up from Jericho, you see Jerusalem very well on top of the mountain. What it would what have been like back then to see these candles? So on the eighth day of the feast, in John 8, I finally gave a scripture reference up to there. In John chapter 8, we see Yeshua going up to the Mount of Olives. At daybreak, he goes to the temple court. People gather around him. He sits down to teach. Here is where he says later in verse number 12. Now remember, I just tied together light and life. life. He says, John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have light, which gives what? Light. Did I have to tie that together? He's already done that for me. John has already done that for me. Light and light are one and the same. What was the first thing that God commanded? Let there be light. We're closing up. Finally, in typology on Hoshana Rabbah, the great Hoshana is what it is. Rabbah means great. Hoshana, praising to God, the great Hoshana Rabbah. If anyone was thirsty, now there's another connection I want to make. There's a connection that we just made with light and life. But there's also a connection between, and I notice how many people have gone over there and got water or coffee and stuff. There's also a connection between water and light. On the last day of the festival, that's when they do the water pouring thing. Yeshua cries out, if anyone is thirsty, let him keep coming to me and drinking. Whoever pours, puts his trust in me, as the scripture says, rivers of mine kain. Living water. Living water is not water that's sitting in a cup someplace. Living water is moving water. Living water is water that cleanses. If you were a leper and you were pronounced clean, where would you go next? Into the mikvah, into the Mayim Chaim, the living water. Now you could have gone into the river. You could have gone into the lake. You could have gone into the ocean. But remember, not a mountain. 
the Syrian general? The Syrian general had leprosy. And he had a servant girl, an Israeli uh, servant girl, who says, well, if the prophet asked you to do something real remarkable, wouldn't he have done it? So he dips himself sometimes into the Jordan River. And he was cleansed. Hey, listen. There's a simple way for all of us to accept the cleansing of our Lord Yeshua. It's through the Mayim Chaim. If there's anything that's dirty within you, the Mayim Chaim will float it away. We need to know that the living waters are the waters that cleanse us. And there's a, you know, when you hear songs, rain upon us now, oh God, rain upon us now, it's talking about two different things. It's not only talking about the fall rains that nourish the earth, but it's also talking about the Holy Spirit raining and falling upon the people. So you've got that dual concept within this feast. And he says this about the Spirit, that living water will flow from your innermost being. How else best to cleanse the dirt of your heart? How best to cleanse our sins? Nothing can cleanse as good as our Lord himself. So this great Hoshana was done on the seventh day of Sukkot. And it had a special water pouring ceremony. They would go ahead and go down to the uh, the uh, uh, springs of Siloam and draw water. So one of the songs that is often sung during this time is Ushak the Mind, which we sang at the very beginning here. Ushak the Mind, this is so the Mind, this is so My, 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 hey, mind, this is so. This is what it's about. The rain coming down, pouring of the water, the nourishing, the cleansing, the Holy Spirit. And that pouring of the water, even though it was held all day, all those seven days, according to the Talmud, it is indeed one of those things that were most looked at on the seventh day. Yes. Is this when they poured the water down the steps? Yes. Okay. Now, tomorrow night, tomorrow night, I'm going to talk about this. Sukkot points to both the first and the second comings of Yeshua. In the first coming of Yeshua, he was born on Sukkot. I'll share with you that. That's when he tabernacled among us, John 1, 14. And tomorrow night, over at the Royal Place at 6 p.m., we're going to talk about that, how the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now I'm going to go past all this, which I've already talked about. Yeshua's coming back. We're all expecting it soon. Amen? Yes. Zechariah chapter 14. And we're going to almost be closed now. You're probably saying, when is he going to finish? Midnight tonight. <laughs> no. Zechariah chapter 14. All the nations are going to come against Israel. Page 785. All the nations are going to come against Israel to war. The Lord is going to go ahead and defeat them. This is the battle of Armageddon. And of all the nations, it says in Zechariah 14, verse 16, it says, finally, everyone remaining from all the nations that came to attack Jerusalem will go up every year to worship the king, Adonai Sebaot, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the festival of Sukkot. If any of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem, see, it's a pilgrimage feast, they will observe this pilgrimage feast or they won't get rain. And it says... To worship the king, Adonai Tzavah, no rain will fall on them. Yet the family of Egypt, now I know one nation then, apart from Israel, that's going to exist after all this. Egypt is one. If they refuse to come, they will have no annual overflow from the Nile. Moreover, there will be the plague which with the Adonai will strike the nations that don't keep the festival of Sukkot. This will be Egypt's punishment and the punishment of all the nations that don't go up to keep the festival of Sukkot. declared to Egypt. What? It just said Egypt's not going to because this is their punishment. Well, if Egypt doesn't, then it's them. So all the nations are going to have to celebrate it. And what birthday is it? Yeshua's birthday. Hey, we're going to get December 25th off the calendar. It's going to be Sukkot because yeah. it's a biblical feast. And we're going to go all and celebrate that. Isn't that awesome? The Lord is going to come reign and rule for a thousand years. And we're going to be alongside of him. We're going to close.